All right. This is actually the compass I use to do my surveying. It's just a combination of a prismatic compass and a base plate compass, as used by orienteers for orienteering. I took up orienteering at the age of 11, and at the age of about 35, I dropped out of office work and decided to make my living from surveying orienteering maps, and this is the compass I use for it. You look for it, and this is the prismatic part of a compass. And when I'm doing my drawing in the snow, it's simply map making backwards. You start with a drawing, treat it like a map, use your compass, walk in a straight line on a compass bearing, count your paces to determine your distance, and apart from the fact using a compass instead of a tractor, and pace counting instead of a ruler, it's much the same as drawing it on a piece of paper. OK, start with a bit of human background. Some pictures of myself taken during my childhood. As soon as I could walk, it became clear that I had a thing about hills and mountains. Big is beautiful, the bigger the better. <clears throat> By the age of nine, I was hiking up Snowdon, leaving my mother behind, of course, and my father when he came with us. That's what I do as an adult, hiking up mountains, particularly at sunset. Now, like most of us, when I do something, I like to have something to show for it. And that usually is good photographs. I put these on the internet. Not a huge number of people actually look at them, but there are some very nice photographs <laughs> on, on my Simon Beck's mountain page on Facebook. It's got about 600 likes compared to over a quarter of a million for my snow art page, so not really very relevant. But I just like looking at these pictures myself. I mean, people like looking at my stuff. Probably nobody actually looks at it more than I do. I had no idea when I started doing it just how spectacular the result could be simply from making footprints in the snow. And since we're talking about looking deeper, the simple rule for making this is you start with a circle, which obviously goes off the edge of the photograph. All you've got to do is walk along the perimeter. When you're a third of the way around, you put an anchor down in the snow, have a rope round around a spool, continue walking around it until you're halfway around, and now you just go around your anchor and make another arc of a circle. And if you can continue that simple rule with every circular arc you've got available, that is what you'll end up with. It's the only fracture I actually claim to have invented myself. I haven't seen that in any book, but I expect someone has invented it somewhere. Stunning results just from walking in footprints. That is about the area of three soccer fields which is about the much, as much as I can do in one day, I, I find in practice. A circle with a diameter of 150 meters is about the area of three soccer fields. More recently, I've been doing it on a beach near my parents' home in Taunton in southwest England. The sea goes up and down on a high spring tide 13 meters or even more, which means we have a great distance between the high tide mark and the low tide mark. And basically, about an hour after high tide, the sea has gone out nearly a kilometer. The sea is, has gone, basically. And for nine or even 10 hours, you've got that amount of space to do a sand drawing. I don't know of any other beach in the world where you've got so much space and so much time to do a sand drawing. So even from a very young age, what I was doing was clearly being done with a sense of purpose. I have no idea what I was doing, but it looks like more of a sense of purpose than most children. And of course, every kid loves snow. And I also love these mathematical shapes. These are polyhedra, three-dimensional mathematical shapes, all but one. That one was made by my mother. The others were all made by myself at the age of nine or 10. Now, so to land art. Southern England has quite a lot of drawings on the ground in Southern England. There's quite a lot sorry, of white horses, 
and other things drawn on the ground. That is reckoned to be the oldest one, 2,000, maybe 3,000 years old. It probably didn't look quite like that when it was first done. There are surely a great many more that have disappeared. Some more recent ones, graffiti, art, whatever. It's everywhere. So, about 10 years ago, I decided to sell my house in southern England and buy an apartment in a ski resort. Really, I wanted to do it a bit sooner, but in England, house prices go up in jumps. They stay the same for 10 years, they double in three years, stay the same for 10 years, double in three years. And so you've got to wait until the time is right before you sell your house in southern England. And the time was right about 10 years ago. So I sold my house in southern England and bought an apartment in a ski resort. I was still quite competitive about my orienteering in those days. And after skiing, I used to try and persuade myself to go out running or hike up the local mountain. But one day I felt a bit lethargic. I knew I had to do something, couldn't quite be bothered to go out running. And so I thought, well, let's make a pattern on this frozen snow-covered lake outside the building where I stay. About two-thirds of the area of a soccer field. Yeah, a lovely area of virgin snow. So I walked into the middle, got my compass. That's the one I just showed you just now. And... I hadn't bought any snowshoes by that time, but I want to show you a picture of some snowshoes before I run out of time. That's the sort of snowshoes you wear. It's just, a, it's just a plastic framework. It's strapped onto the bottom of your boots, so you spread your weight more, and you can walk through deep snow without sinking in too far. And I decided to make a drawing. Again, this is a bit out of sequence. I'm putting it in now just to illustrate the point. The top drawing and the bottom drawing are, of course, two photographs of the same drawing, except the top one, the sun is shining, the bottom one, it isn't. You can see the area that's been shaded by walking backwards and forwards looks a quite different colour to the unshaded snow. Here, when the sun is not shining, they look virtually the same colour. So they look a lot better when the sun is shining. They work through the fact that there's a shadow down inside the footprint. In fact, that's not quite so simple as that. When you're looking away from the sun as you are here, what you're seeing is the sun shining on the vertical face of the far side of the footprint. So looking away from the sun, the footprint looks lighter than the untouched snow. If you're looking towards the sun, the bit that's been shaded would look darker because you'd be looking at the shadow in the footprints. So these things do look different in different directions and at different times of day which, again, sidetracking slightly, is one reason it's very difficult to do time-lapse videos of snow drawing. I put this in because I get asked for time-lapse videos so much. It's very difficult because you can only see it when the sun is shining on it. The lake I prefer to do my drawings on in Arc 2000. In fact, at the, at the sort of turn of a new year, the sun only shines on the whole of the lake for about half an hour in the middle of the day. Apart from that half hour, part of the lake, if not all of it, is in shadow. So they only really look good when the sun's on them. One of the reasons why snow is more difficult than sand. Anyway, moving quickly on. I went back to my drawing in the lake, and I went out from the middle, and I made five equally spaced points using my compass and my pace counting. Joined them up into a star, filled in the wasted parts of the lake, and that was my first snow drawing. And when it got covered up by fresh snowfall, I made a more complicated one. Simply joining up 10 accurately measured points and then shading the alternate segments until the whole of the lake is covered in the drawing. At the time, I had no snowshoes. I had no digital camera. We had no internet in Arc 2000, apart from this internet cafe where you're forced to listen to this diabolical music. So I didn't actually go there very much, and um, these didn't get on the internet. Later on, I, I did one on the other lake and took a shot with a decent camera, and the result is pretty stunning. So, what motivates me to do it? At first, it was just a bit of fun. Everyone likes drawing Space Invaders. That's one on the beach. No one else, as far as I know, has yet done the entire grid of 55 Space Invaders plus the shelters and the later base, and the mystery spaceship that flies along the top. So I wanted to be the first to do that. No one else has done the Teletubbies. 
or the Millennium Falcon, or the Simpsons. And some of you may just about be able to recognize that as Michael Jackson. <laughs> Sometimes it's just for the a sort of a challenge to try and get it to look good. That would look really good done in the snow or on a beach. It's all straight lines, so it should be possible to do it in the snow. I want to have a go at that sometimes, a three-dimensional representation of a Sierpinski triangle, which I shall go on to right at the end, um, if I'm allowed to run over time enough. And sometimes I do it just because it's such a fantastic location. That's a lake in the Dolomites, shot in September about a year ago, early snowfall, not usually snow at that time of year, but it was just so fantastic. I thought, what a great place to come make a snow drawing. In fact, there's two lakes and a great hut to stay in, with a chapel to pray for good weather. Um, I get inspired by these two people particularly. The chap on the left is a guy called Guillaume Dargaud. He's just a person who's got a really good website, 35 million hits he claims last time I looked at it. He's done a lot of climbing, he's quite a Brady guy, just put, puts a lot of sort of C code and fixes on his website. And I, I wanted to produce something outstanding on the internet. And that was what first motivated me to do the snow drawing and put them online. It's really to try and get something really outstanding on the internet. Um, something as good as his website. And the other person I would claim is the artist Vincent van Gogh. Basically because he was so talented, he worked so hard. He did so many incredible paintings in just seven years before it all came to a sad end. Like that, for instance. And of course, I needed a way of keeping in shape. The point where the snow drawing really kicked off. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite that good, I'm afraid. <laughs> the point where it really kicked off was when my feet got too badly damaged to really continue with serious orienteering. And I thought, I want to make this snow drawing my main form of exercising during the winter, and I want to take it seriously and build up a collection of pictures with the aim of publishing them or, or, or something. And that's when things really started to get going with the snow drawing, about five years ago, and I took it seriously. And it wasn't long after that that things started sort of snowballing, if I may use that expression. I started getting given some gear. I got given some snowshoes and some clothes. And then a deal came up with icebreaker clothing, which is what I'm wearing now. And once I'd got just some money for it, it doesn't have to be a lot, just some money, I could then rationalize doing the measuring which is the boring part of it. I mean, this, this measuring process at the start, using the compass and pace, pacing things out, is, is a boring, tough, tedious process. It's much like my previous job of making orienteering maps. And I don't really enjoy doing it very much, but once you've got money, you could then rationalize doing something you don't enjoy. I, I now regard it as my job. Every job has got the bit you like and the bit you don't like. <clears throat> and of course, some of them are motivated by environmental issues, protect our winters, global warming, save the rainforest, World Peace, that's a copy of the John Lennon Memorial in New York Central Park. Uh, safe sex, AIDS prevention. The next one's going to be about this drink culture and getting drunk, staying up all night, getting pissed, especially when you're underage. And I regard it as a film set. Once you've got the photographs, it's finished. You've done the job. This is what happens when it doesn't get covered up by fresh snowfall. What's happened here is there's not been enough snowfall and the old drawing has not been completely covered up. And so the new drawing is now basically on top of the old drawing. The Japanese, ten, the Japanese came around, ITTEQ as their logo. Um, they came around to film me doing this. We're rather disappointed to find it wasn't actually quite as good as they hoped it would be. But the weather's not very good either, which doesn't help. They could have got a result like that if they'd come on a, a decent day. That is actually the drawing you could see underneath the one you were meant to be looking at on the previous slide. A long period of dry weather, that's what happens. Every area you could possibly make a snow drawing gets covered in old drawings and tracks. So you can't do any new drawings. The Nazca lines is what it looks like when it doesn't get covered up. It's a bit more annoying when this happens. This is the second attempt at a drawing on the beach. That was the first attempt, it was nearly finished. When it started raining and half it simply disappeared. That holds the record for the longest lived drawing. That hung around for about eight weeks, gradually fading away in a long period of dry weather three or four years ago. That's the shortest lived. Did it at night under the street lamps. By the time I finished it, it just started snowing again. You can see the snowflakes in that picture, somewhere in, 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 near the bottom. By next morning, it had been completely covered up by fresh snowfall. 
but I did at least get some pictures of it. The colors aren't true, of course. Artificial light, my rules are you're allowed to do any amount of tinkering with the colors in Photoshop. It's artificial light. It could have been a blue light, couldn't it? So why not change it to a blue color? <laughs> That's the biggest I did. It's about half finished there. Looks quite good even when it's half finished. But by the time I finished it, it had clouded over. I was rather disappointed. The clouds came along two hours before I finished it. it took 22 hours in, in the end. Previous night, I'd been plodding around in the moonlight for about hmm, six, seven hours, I think. Ages plodding around in the moonlight, which sounds romantic, but when you spend a lot of time in the moonlight, it's just like watching television in black and white when you're used to color, so it's not actually that romantic. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, that's what it's like. You're just going backwards and forwards. I mean. That's the most complicated one. It's about half finished there, and that's about half of it. I really like the photographs when you've got skiers in it. It, it adds you know, another dimension to it, and it's nice to see all the people enjoying it. I feel I have to do with these drawings in Lazare because I get given free ski passes by the resort, and I think they get value for money from it. I mean, the amount of time people waste looking at these drawings is easily equivalent to a ski pass being wasted over the whole season. I mean, why not? That's the thing when it's completed. I'll go back to that later on if I can overrun a little bit. Okay, now how is it done? Yeah, we're meant to be looking at deeper at this, aren't we? So there's a minute and a half to look deeper at these things. Okay, how is it done? Um, yeah, you print it out, trace it into a cartoon, and then you pick out some main lines for it, and you survey the main lines using plodding and plotting like I showed you at the start. So the green lines on that picture don't look quite so obvious up there as they do down here. The green lines are the main lines. You plot those out first, and if you can get those fairly accurate, then you can do the rest by judgment and get a good result. That was a ram's horn, which is actually printed on my shirt. Um, that was a commission drawing for these people who make merino wool clothing. You can do it using a grid. You can't really do it in the snow like that because you get too many unwanted tracks, but in theory you could. Works on the beach. That's what I did using a grid on the beach. I mean, very simply, you can just draw two lines at an angle and measure some points on the lines and join them up, shade alternate areas, put six back to back, and you get a very nice star. So it's not, it's not that difficult. You get these people on the internet saying, oh, that's awesome, how do you do that? There's been a few people saying, you know, this cannot be done by one person in one day. I don't believe your claim. I demand you provide me with a time-lapse video showing you doing it. And I just say, well, look, you know, it can be done by one person in one day. If you don't believe it, you can come and see me doing it. It's witnessed by thousands of skiers. So that's about the end of it, basically. So this is a very simple process. And you can see one of these I've drawn on the board outside in, in the foyer. Get a triangle and just stick triangles around the edge of it. Carry on around the edge, sticking triangles on it. It's called a Koch curve, named after a Swedish mathematician. It's the very, the very first named fractal, apparently. There's one in the snow. That took 11 hours. That was a very good one. Yes! I, I knew, yeah, I... <laughs> that wasn't actually meant to be the end, although 22 seconds later, no, we're in the red now, 24 seconds over time. Yeah, um, yeah, I, was, I hardly put a foot wrong on that one, so I was quite pleased with that one. I get a lot of requests for that. Anyway, this is a complicated one, and this is how it's done. Okay, it's a Mandelbrot set. Start with that, put circles on it. Okay, it's not really a Mandelbrot set, because those circles are much too big, but you're allowed to distort it to fit the space you've got available. Just carry on sticking circles on it, and you've got the Mandelbrot set. Then each circuit layer was divided up into five roughly equal segments, and then the triangular areas result are treated like a Sierpinski triangle. So complicated thing, as usual, is an assembly of much simpler components. The question is working out how to do it. Sierpinski triangle very easily. Teacher, you know, I taught a six-year-old kid how to do it in a few minutes a couple of weeks ago. Just get the triangle, divide up the edges into halfway, join up the halfway edges, and you've then got four triangles, leave the middle one as it is and treat the same treatment to the other three triangles around the edge. Got that far, and the six-year-old lad said, yeah, I know what comes next, and off he went. So, there's one on the beach. Back to this one, that's what you end up. Just one last thing to mention, the actual shading within these triangles, that stripy shading is done like this. You just walk along parallel to where you're going, backwards and forwards, 
And then the third time you row, you just yeah, you hold out a ski stick just to mark a uniform gap until the next row of three. Right, the future, I'd like to get some bigger drawings done. Too many drawings, we're just running out of time. You can see the tides coming in there. I did nearly get that one finished. That one was about two-thirds finished. So, yeah, I mean, really, I need to, I need to get some teams organized to do some bigger drawings and try and get them finished. So, there's no reason why anybody else can't do this. I found this on the internet two nights ago. Someone did it for Valentine's Day um, last February. That, that is the biggest one I've seen that someone else has done. It's the nearest, I would say, the nearest I've done to someone actually doing what I've done on, on the internet. So, yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe a lot of people are going to start doing it. Hopefully, someone will come and help me. All right, thank you.